Good afternoon and hello everyone. Welcome to our first ever virtual Grad Slam finals and happy International Women's Day. Remember that when you meet our finalists. My name is Lila Roop and I have the pleasure of serving as Interim Dean of the Graduate Division and your host for today's exciting event. In 2013, our former Dean, Carol Dinetti, who might be tuning in today from Abu Dhabi, if she can't sleep, came up with the brilliant concept for Grad Slam. As you probably all know, the idea is for students to present their research and its importance in three minutes. When graduate students are going in the job market, we talk about their elevator speech, how they'll describe their research if they run into someone in the elevator who asks, what are you studying? I have to admit, I would have flunked my elevator speech. So I'm really impressed by what these students can do. But as you can see from our finalists, these are much more than just elevator speeches. Last year, the pandemic kept us from holding Grad Slam since there wasn't really time to switch into virtual mode. This year, we wondered how many students would compete given the demands of producing video, but we weren't disappointed. And we've heard that at least some students preferred the virtual format to the anxieties of performing live. This may be one of those things that we'll do differently and better than in the past. 50 students competed in the qualifying round of Grad Slam. In five groups of 10, they were evaluated by panels of judges from the campus community who were selected to ensure disciplinary Di disciplinary diversity. The top two scores from each qualifying group became our 10 finalists, the ones you'll hear from today. All of the talks for the final round have been pre-recorded and our panel of esteemed judges have evaluated them separately over the past several weeks to determine the winners. Our grand prize winner will receive $5,000 and our two runners up will each receive $2,500. Audience members tuning into the live stream will also have a chance to vote at the end of the broadcast for the People's Choice Award winner, who will receive $1,500. All other students who competed in the final round will take home $750 in prize money, and all of our finalists will receive Sonos speakers. The winner of the final round will also compete in the UC-wide Grad Slam, which will be held virtually on May 7th and hosted by UC President Michael Drake. It's not an easy job, judging Grad Slam, and especially when it comes to the exceptional finalists you'll see today. We're grateful to our qualifying round judges and to our illustrious judges for this final round. Gerardo Aldana, Dean of the College of Creative Studies, Carol Gennetti, Vice Provost for Graduate and Postdoctoral Programs at NYU Abu Dhabi, and Ann and Michael Tobes, Graduate Dean Emerita, Joseph Incandela, Vice Chancellor for Research, Margaret Clawoon, Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, and David Marshall, Executive Vice Chancellor. We're also grateful to our donors whose gifts make this event possible. Not that the intellectual challenge alone would not draw students to the competition, but it really makes a difference. Big thanks to Yardi, QAD, BD, Boone Graphics, Flexibility, the Santa Barbara Independent, HRL Laboratories, Drs. Carrie Tobes and John Lewis, Microsoft, and Sonos. Needless to say, our amazing graduate division staff put endless hours each year into producing Grad Slam. This year required ingenuity to translate into the virtual format, and so many people helped that to make them all, to mention them all right now, would cut into our time in the program. But a big shout out to everyone and especially to Sean Warner, our Director of Professional Development, and Hannah Lawrence, her Assistant Director, our Grand Slam gurus. At this point, imagine thunderous applause. And now to the presentations. After each video, I'll ask a couple of questions of each student as if we are all in Corwin Pavilion and the pandem pandemic never happened. There will be time later for audience questions. So as they occur to you, put them in the chat box located to the right of your screen on the YouTube page. When you've seen all the students, I'll ask your questions to the presenters as you vote for the People's Choice Award. Without further ado, here's Emily Hardison, Ecology, Evolution, and Marine Biology. I spend most of my time thinking about fish. 
but that's because fish are super important. There are over 30,000 species of them. They serve critical roles in their environments, and they're a primary protein source to an estimated 1 billion people around the world. But climate change is threatening fish worldwide. So it's important that we understand how fish are going to respond and what types of changes they can tolerate so that we can best manage around them. Now, climate change is predicted to have many effects on aquatic environments, but changes in temperature are one of the most concerning for fish. And that's because fish don't internally regulate their body temperature. So when the water's cold, so is the inside of the fish and vice versa when it's warm. And what this means for fish is that all of their abilities, like how fast they can swim and grow and eat and even reproduce, are extremely sensitive to changes in environmental temperature. Now, when faced with these unfavorable temperatures, we currently think that fish have three options. One, they can move to more suitable habitat. Two, they can adapt over multiple generations. And three, they can acclimate to those new environmental conditions. But given the speed with which temperature is changing, acclimation is considered a critical coping mechanism. So what even is acclimation? Well, during temperature acclimation, fish undergo a full-scale total body makeover where they can change everything from the size of their hearts to the number of mitochondria present in each one of their cells. And these changes improve and regulate their responses to changes in temperature. And the best news is that this entire makeover process can happen in just weeks. So we think of acclimation as an intrinsic ability to a fish, something that that animal is born with. But my research is exploring how changes in what fish are eating may alter their ability to undergo this critical makeover process. Now, we know that fish change their diet all the time in the wild. They do it in response to things like how much food is available to them, and who they're competing with for those resources. But what we're now learning is that many fish change what they're eating specifically in response to changes in environmental temperature. So I study a local omnivorous fish called the opali that live in the kelp forest here off Santa Barbara and that appear to be one of these diet shifters. Specifically, opali eat more plants in their diet as water temperatures increase. And so I'm really interested in diet preference in these fish. And I ask the question, are opali making diet choices that improve their ability to acclimate in the face of climate change? Or are their choices making them even more vulnerable? Emily, that was amazing. Thank you. So let me just ask you a couple of questions. Um, when did you first decide that you wanted to be a marine biologist? And what was it that attracted you? Yeah, um, so I, I've always been interested in marine biology, um, but really taking a diving class at UC Santa Cruz is kind of the first time that I was like, this is the real deal. This is what I'd really like to do. Um, so I went to UC Santa Cruz for undergrad. And during this diving class, I grew up in the Bay Area, but I'd never actually put my face in the water. Um, and when I finally did that in this diving class, I was just astounded at how beautiful the kelp forests here in California are um, and how, how just how wonderful the ecosystems are here. So that was that moment in the water. That's what really did it. Yeah, it was shocking. <laughs> it was like, this is insanely beautiful. If you haven't <laughs> put your face in the water in Santa Barbara or anywhere in California, you need to do it. I have to admit, it's a little cold for me. I'm, I'm used to the tropics, but uh, so where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in the Bay Area. Yeah, so pretty close to where I went to undergrad. Oh, it's, it's all familiar to you, yeah. So what is the hardest thing about your research and what is the, uh, the most fun? I guess putting your face in the water, you've already answered that part. What's the hardest? <laughs> yeah, the, the hardest part is definitely catching the fish. So there are certain times of year where the water's really cold, like right now, where it's virtually impossible to catch the fish because they're just not eating that much. Um, so we really have to think carefully about when we're planning these big experiments around when we can actually catch fish and bring them into the lab. Uh, but the best part about what I do is that um, I work in a really wonderful lab group with a bunch of nerdy fish scientists. And I just 
love being able to nerd out about fish with them all the time. And so that's definitely just a constant privilege is just being in the Eliasson lab. And with all that of sounds wonderful. Well, that may have answered my, my last question. I'm going to ask you, what's your favorite place on campus? Uh, well, I will. The lab is a wonderful place, but in terms of just a spot to go and get a nice view and kind of decompress, I would say Campus Point is, I mean, it's a world-class view. It's hard to beat that. So I, I sometimes wonder how students ever leave here. So I, I totally understand. Well, thank you very much. And um, now we're going to move on to our next presenter, who is um, Greta Kumarianu. Um, in chemistry and biochemistry. Are we alone in the universe? I remember asking myself since I was a child, and I know I wasn't the only one. Since civilization began, fascination by the thought of alien life has been around. However, we don't have an answer yet. That's far outside of Earth, there have been no clear signs of life. And that is because we need better tools than the ones available today. That's exactly what I do for my research. I'm developing new tools to help us get answers about life outside Earth and our fundamental existence. But how life looks like at the very beginning, before it showcases as animals, plants or microbes. Life is a combination of some chemical soup, energy and water. Now me as a chemist, I have always been interested in this chemical soup and the ingredients are molecules we all know, such as DNA, proteins, or sugars. But something fascinating that I've learned later on is that they have two versions, like our hands and our feet. We have a right hand and a left hand, and a right and a left foot. And likewise, there is right-handed DNA and left-handed DNA, and sugars, amino acids, and proteins have left and right versions as well. So before life began, nature had supplies for both right and left-handed species, but used only one of them to create life. For instance, our cells only have the right-handed version of DNA. So everything you know about DNA and how amazing it is, it is actually only true for just the right DNA. The left DNA is not observed in living organisms and it is useless for creating life. And yes, it is indeed weird that nature only chose to use one, but that is exactly what makes it a very unique signature of life. Detecting an excess of one version means detecting life. So in Mars, and the Moons Titan and Europa, chemical species with handiness have already been detected. However, we need to be able to measure the ratio of right to left versions to make any claims for life. My instrument measures these ratios by exciting the molecules with a unique combination of two light pulses. Right and left versions respond to that excitation by emitting a third pulse. The difference lies at the phase of the third pulse, which is opposite for the two versions. However, how easy is it to detect a very small excess of one version in a universe where the probability to find life is 1 in 60 billion? Not easy at all, but this is what the instrument I'm building aims to achieve. And although it didn't catch the latest flight to Mars, I hope we will be on board on a future mission. Will we have an answer within our lifetimes? Time will tell, but the truth for sure is still out there. Greta, thank you. That was wonderful. That was truly wonderful. So tell me, um, when, did, uh, when did you first decide you wanted to be a chemist? Uh, or you know, study chemistry, biochemistry, like what, the very first moment that you thought, this is what I really want to do. Yeah, so I just wanted to do something with the sciences. Uh, and I really, uh, I just went into the chemistry program um, without actually knowing what I want to do. But when I did my first uh, physical chemistry course, which was when we, we used physics to study chemistry, I just found it very, um, interesting that the depth of understanding and I could finally answer some of the questions I was uh, curious about before. So I guess that was the moment. So it was really, it was in class really. Yeah, so in like, class and undergrad. So um, where did you grow up and uh, what, what was it like there? Yeah, so I am from Mykonos. It's a small island in Greece. Uh, so it's very popular. Uh, so yeah, uh, the locals we are five thousand, but there are millions of people that come in summer. So definitely a very interesting experience. 
so you could meet lots of people from, from all over. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, it's beautiful, like here. So it's the beach, the sea, and but at the beach, there's always some DJ playing some house music. <laughs> so that's no, the difference from, with California. From one beautiful place to another beautiful place. That's great. So Indeed. what? Uh, well, you already referred to the fact that this is that this is a, a very tiny uh, thing that you have to measure. Um, what is, what is the hardest part of the research that you do? You. Yeah, so we're trying to develop, uh, you know, build this instrument for other scientists to use or like develop new methods. So it really requires uh, a lot of understanding of many skills, like obviously chemistry, you need to know physics, mechanical engineering, some vacuum, electronics. So you really need to be good at all of those to troubleshoot it on a daily basis. And uh What's the best part of the, doing research? Yeah, okay. The best part is, uh, so I feel very uh, good about it because I feel it's uh, like a perfect match for me. I felt this is the research topic that I'm passionate about and I didn't want to do anything else. <laughs> and I also really like um, my lab. It's like a great environment to grow and I really like the people there. So this perfect maths at UCSB. And then my last question, what's your favorite place on campus? Yeah, so I also love Campus Point. I would like to add that it's beautiful when you go there when it's the full moon, because sometimes there is some scattering and the moon is red. Like you see the red reflection uh, on the ocean. So that's very pretty. And second one, I would say the lagoon is like very pretty. You can go running around it. Yes, we all miss it, I think, being away from campus. Well, thank you very much. And, thank uh, you. And good luck. So thank now you. we will we will move on to our next presenter, Nora Kastner from the Department of History. What is a family? Is it a group of people who love one another or a legal arrangement defined by responsibilities and protections? And who decides? Individuals, courts, governments, religious organizations? Well, this spring, the Supreme Court will seek to redefine family for generations. The case is Fulton v. City of Philadelphia. In this case, the Supreme Court will determine whether religiously affiliated foster care organizations can refuse to place children with queer foster parents. If the court rules against queer foster parents, it will worsen the crisis in our nation's foster care system, where there are already thousands of children with nowhere safe to go. I'm a historian, and when I look at Fulton v. City of Philadelphia, I think, I've seen this before. In 1989, Stephen Lofton and Roger Croto were nurses at a Miami hospital where they cared for a child and a father, both with HIV. When the father asked Stephen and Roger to take his child, they inadvertently became the boy's foster parents. Now, at the time, Florida's preferred foster parents were white, straight people, but they often refused to take children with HIV, especially when those children were Black or Latinx. And so, out of a desperate need to find foster parents, a tacit association between queerness and HIV, and a belief that no one would care about queer people caring for children who are likely to die young. The state allowed Stephen and Roger to foster. When Stephen and Roger tried to adopt, however, the state of Florida and the US Supreme Court said they could not adopt because they were queer. I've talked to queer foster parents like Stephen and Roger around the country, and what I've learned makes me hopeful that even if the Supreme Court rules against queer foster parents in 2021, the same way it ruled against Stephen and Roger, the court's on the wrong side of history. In my research, I find that individual battles by foster parents and social workers are the driving force in US family policy, able to expand the definition of family, no matter what the court says. How do I know this? because it's already happening. Despite everything, Stephen and Roger kept their family together. And last year, they welcomed their first granddaughter. When I see this, I know that the definition of family in all of its complicated, multifaceted glory 
has expanded just a little bit more. Uh, Nora, thank you. That was terrific. Thank you. So let me ask you the question. Um, when did you wake up and think, I think I want to be a historian? And what was it that really attracted you? <laughs> so when I was an undergrad, I said there was no way on earth I was ever going to grad school. It was not going to happen. So I did what your very social justice minded young person did. And I found state political campaigns that I could work on in Minnesota. And one of them was the a fight to defeat an anti-marriage amendment and then pass marriage equality in Minnesota. And as I was walking, working on that campaign, I kept seeing the ways that race and class were being silenced from our conversation. And I kept asking myself, why is that? What's going on? So kind of long story short, those questions really stayed with me. And I eventually realized that I needed to go to a place where I could ask those questions and begin to figure out why our queer history has become the way it has turned into what it has become and whether there are places where we can find queer stories that really do put race and class at the center. So you could have gone a lot of directions with that kind of realization. So um, yeah, very interesting that you decided to make that connection between history and, and, and this. What can I so, say? Um, <laughs> so, uh, where did you grow up and uh, what, uh, what did you particularly like about it? I grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And for me, what I really loved about it was that as a kid, I could walk from my house and go to the University of Michigan campus and I could sit on the diag, the big grass with my group of friends and think that I was the coolest thing ever because <laughs> everyone would think I was one of those very grown up college students. <laughs> That's great. Um, so from Ann Arbor to Minnesota to Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. A little warmer here. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what's the hardest thing and what's the best thing about doing the research? So I'll say the best thing first, which is that people trust me with their stories. And I get to talk to people around the country who have done this work and lived this life. And they trust me to listen to them and to tell the world about what they do. And it amazes me every day that people actually want me to do that. So in the flip side, then I'd say the hardest thing is the ethical dilemma that I have, that it is a lot easier to find the stories of foster parents than it is to find the stories of foster children or their birth families. Yeah. So I struggle every day with figuring out how to undo some of the silences in the record and try to figure out how to make sure that I'm telling a story that encompasses the full complexity of this family life in the United States. And your favorite place on campus? My favorite place, I'll stick with the true historian theme <laughs> and say that the special research, the special collections room on the third floor of the library is just amazingly beautiful. And it's such a, a hidden gem because most people don't get to go up there. So it's such a treat if you ever can. Great. That is a real historian's answer. So thank you very much. Okay, so we will move to our next presentation. Kelsey Dowdy from Ecology, Evolution, and Marine Biology. My research unites the ecology and ethnomusicology of Arundo Donax, the bamboo-like plant that makes this flute. It is originally from the Middle East, where in some traditions, the Arundo flute is said to sing the song of the pain of the world. This is a great metaphor for how Arundo thrives as a weed in degraded agricultural watersheds in California. Here, Arundo reduces native plant diversity, alters food webs and is highly flammable, thus millions of dollars are spent to remove it. Arundo sings of the pain, but plant restoration practices typically address the symptom, removing Arundo, rather than the source, nitrogen-rich agricultural runoff. Understanding Arundo as a symptom of landscape degradation rather than the problem itself offers the potential to link land management goals of minimizing agricultural pollution and enabling healthy native plant communities. So 
we aren't going to get rid of agriculture, but we could minimize agricultural runoff. Organic precision agriculture can have half the nitrogen runoff as industrial agriculture, which could mean less arundo growth and as a result, less inhibition of native plant growth. So I set up an experiment to see how arundo affected the growth of native willow trees in three different levels of nitrogen. No nitrogen, representing ecosystems receiving no agricultural runoff. Low nitrogen, representing organic agricultural runoff. And high nitrogen, representing industrial agricultural runoff. I found that in conditions of no nitrogen and low nitrogen, arundo did not significantly affect willow's growth. But in high nitrogen conditions, Arundo grew more and decreased Willow's growth by 60%. So if Arundo sings the song of the pain of the world, we can address the source of this pain by minimizing our nitrogen runoff and prioritizing organic precision agriculture. And we can improve plant restoration practices by using holistic watershed management, linking conservation efforts to improve ecosystem and human health. Thank you. Kelsey, thank you. Wow. A whole uh, multimedia presentation. That was great. Thank you. So um, I gather you're on the ecology side of uh, ecology, evolution, and marine biology. So when did that first, when did we just wake up and say, I think I want to do this kind of work? Um, probably when I was about six years old, uh, my parents took me to the Natural History Museum and I saw this ticker, these bright red numbers, um, and it was going up so fast and it turned out it was the number of trees, acres of trees being cut down in the Amazon and I just couldn't believe that that many trees could disappear that fast and, you know, in my innocent mind, I was like, no, I'm going to fix that. We can't do that. Haven't you all heard? Trees are great. <laughs> so doing my best out here now in grass so, with that goal in mind. So that was the moment. So, so how did you get from there to here? From the six-year-old to the graduate school? Right? Yeah, spending a lot of time outside. Um, I was born in Boston, and then we moved to St. Louis, Missouri, and then we moved out to California. And so just being a part of so many different landscapes and just finding refuge, you know, when you had no friends, when you move in those natural spaces and just really feeling the importance of that and seeing um, so much that comes out of that from our drinking water to our food to just like a refuge of, you know, for our spirits. So then I just decided to keep it going. And um, my dad's uh, also a scientist. So the nerd thing is the angle it took. <laughs> So which is your favorite of the places that you live? Definitely. Well, now I would say it's Santa Barbara. Um, really special that there's still places in Southern California that have so much open space. You know, San Diego is beautiful with the ocean and the beaches, but I just, you know, there's so much beauty in these open spaces and I hope we get to keep them. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So, um, what, what is the, well, probably the hardest thing about your research is the, are those ticking numbers of the trees, but um, <laughs> what's the, what, what is the hardest? What's the, what's the most fun? So the hardest is probably sampling in creeks and rivers can sometimes get a little rough. Um, a lot of poison oak, um, a lot of sort of, um, you know, mishaps, uh, one notable experience was getting yelled at on the Santa Clara River by Lompoc prison, um, by the prison guards. Uh, so just trying to navigate all these interesting variables, you know, where, where there's a rondo, there's typically, um, I mean, it's everywhere, but in places like, like, you know, the San Inez River where there's a rondo, it's in lower income areas. And so navigating those social dynamics has become really interesting with a rondo and really difficult too. Um, there's a lot of people who live in a rondo, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's a, I would say challenging, but really rewarding part of it is how, how it all connects like that. It's funny, this plant has so many different aspects to it. It's hated and it's beloved, you know? So I think 
all of that is what's so difficult and so great. So. And um, your favorite place on campus? My favorite place is the uh, campus radio station studio, KCSB FM 91.9. Uh, yeah, I had a radio show there and there's this amazing music library full of uh, vinyl and CDs and all these photographs from, uh, you know, the station's been around since the 60s. So all these photographs of students being involved in that and just the music and the people there are really special. So very cool oh, place that's to be heard. 91.9 FM. <laughs> I've been to that. I've been to the studio. So I, I get it. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you so much. And um, good luck. And um, we'll go to our next presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Caitlin Zigner from the Department of Geography. Twenty twenty was an unprecedented year for many reasons one of which was the extreme wildfire activity observed around the globe. The year started with wildfires in Australia, burning over 45 million acres, which is approximately the size of Washington state. In summer, wildfires in Brazil burned 5.4 million acres of the Amazon rainforest, affecting inhabitants, animals, and the global carbon budget. Then in fall, wildfires ravaged Colorado, Washington, Oregon, and California, marking the highest total of acres burned in the U.S since records began in 1983. It's no secret that wildfires are common here in Santa Barbara as well. With warming temperatures and a drying climate, wildfire intensity and frequency are projected to increase. This combined with human spread into previously uninhabited regions greatly increases the likelihood of wildfire ignition and increases the overall wildfire risk. It's clear that the need for advances in wildfire research are as critical as ever. In my lab, we examine both fire weather and wildfire simulations. My work includes modeling potential ignition locations and running fire models to determine areas of high risk during extreme fire weather conditions in coastal Santa Barbara. In California, 90% of wildfire ignitions are caused by humans. Hence, ignitions have a higher frequency near roads and trails. To model ignitions, I used a distance decay function around roads and trails, where closer areas have a higher probability of selection. These are the dark red areas in this image. I then sampled 100 points to use as ignitions for my wildfire simulations. These are the yellow dots in this image. Now, you'll see a video showing four of the wildfire simulations in action. The red shading is the fire spread, and the difference between each image is 15 minutes in the simulation. You can see that the strong winds from the northeast, known locally as sundowners, are rapidly spreading the fire south toward highly populated areas. The fires are also spreading laterally on the mountain slopes. After we ran simulations for all 100 ignition points, we calculated the number of times each grid cell was hit by a wildfire. As you can see in this image, most areas in the mountain slope were hit in at least one simulation. Light yellow areas indicate few hits, and red areas indicate six or more hits. Two regions stand out as receiving more hits in the east and west regions of our area of interest, although many simulations spread concerningly far south toward the city. While these simulations allow us to examine areas that may be of higher wildfire risk, we must remember that these simulations were run using a single wind case study, and we should expect different results with other wind inputs and ignition locations. Going forward, we are planning to run more simulations to test whether we can more definitively locate regions at higher risk, focusing on regions closer to the city. Through this work, we aim to increase resilience to wildfires by communicating these findings to city planners and officials. From there, additional safety procedures and policies may be incorporated to protect high-risk regions in coastal Santa Barbara. Caitlin, great. That was Thank really you. interesting. And Thank obviously you. very relevant for us to know this information. Extremely. So when did you first decide, uh, did you decide you wanted to be go into geography or was it uh, a more general interest? But when did you first decide that you wanted to do what you're doing? Yeah, uh, so I really didn't know until I was a senior in college and my mom asked, what do you wanna do in college? So she was saying that I loved watching the Weather Channel when I was young and I was like, okay, I'll consider meteorology. But then we were at my senior photos and the tornado sirens went off. I grew up in Southern Wisconsin. So tornadoes occur a decent amount um, throughout the year. And I ran outside instead of running in the basement and she ran after me. And that's kind of when I knew that I wanted to study meteorology. So then after that, meteorology and geography are really, really connected. 
Um, and that's the program that I was accepted into at UCSD. Great. Well, that's a, that's a dramatic story from tornadoes to wildfires and earthquakes and tsunamis. Exactly. So do you, do you grew up, you grew up in Wisconsin? I did. Yeah. Kind of in the suburbs. Great. And you came directly here from there or did you go to school elsewhere? Yeah, I went to school at Valparaiso in Indiana. So still the Midwest. Um, we still got lots of thunderstorms. We got lots of humidity, lots of winter storms. So lots of extreme weather situations. And when I came to Santa Barbara, my advisor was saying that she wanted someone to study the wildfire weather. Uh, it was 2016 when I started. There were some wildfires that occurred previously that summer, like summer, like the Sherpa fire. Um, and someone really needs to start looking into fire weather in the lab. So I volunteered and one thing led to another, another, and now I'm nearing the end of my degree and I'm starting to run these wildfire simulations to connect fire weather and wildfire simulation research. Oh, that's great. So what is, what is the hardest part of it? Um, I'm sure like worrying about fires and what they do must be, must be hard, but in terms of the technical parts, what's the hardest part and what's the most uh, exciting? Yeah, um, the most difficult part is probably getting the data itself in order to run the fire simulations and know how good they are, we have to have fire perimeters of fires that have occurred previously. So sometimes those are available every hour if we're really lucky, if there were helicopters or drones above. But most of the time there's one maybe every two hours and maybe even every day. So in that case, we're not really sure how good the wildfire model is running uh, in the time in between. So it's really hard to calibrate what we observe to what we're modeling. But at the same time, it's really rewarding connecting the meteorology aspect to the more geographical aspect as well. And I'd say that's the best part. Oh, that's great. And uh, your favorite place on campus? I really like running and jogging. So just running around the lagoon is my favorite thing to do and the, my favorite place to be on campus. Yeah, that is a pretty, that's a pretty wonderful place. So um, thank you so much and, um, and good luck. Thank you so thank you. much. So now um, our next presentation is by Denai Hernandez Cortez from the Department of Economics. Environmental markets have been increasingly used in order to address environmental problems. For instance, 20% of global greenhouse gas emissions are regulated using one market. The key feature is that markets determine where pollution is occurring. And by doing so, it lowers the overall cost of meeting an environmental objective. However, pollution shift may lead to disadvantaged communities to be more exposed to pollution than other communities, meaning that there could be an environmental justice concern. This is that disadvantaged communities could be consistently more exposed to pollution coming from the program than other communities. California's cap and trade market has faced environmental justice opposition since, in, since its introduction. How does a carbon market work? First, it sets a cap on the overall level of emissions, and then it allows firms to trade permits in order to pollute. In this paper, Professor Kyle Meng and I are analyzing whether California's cap and trade market created environmental injustice after the program introduction. How do we do that? First, we isolate the emissions coming by the pro from the program by comparing regulated versus unregulated facilities before and after the program starts. Then, we assign pollution exposure by using an atmospheric transport model. This allows us to, to locate all of the pollution emitters and then associate their pollution using atmospheric patterns. This is accounting for weather, wind, and other factors that could affect exposure to pollution. Then we compare whether disadvantaged communities and other communities experience a higher reduction after, or in pollution after the introduction of the program. This means we compare disadvantaged communities before and after the program starts. What do we find? First, we find that before the program starts, the, the, the difference between disadvantaged communities and other communities is increasing, meaning that the pollution exposure difference between both types of communities is increasing before the program, 
This means that environmental injustice is increasing before the program starts. However, we find that after the program starts, we see a complete reversal of that trend, meaning that disadvantaged communities experience a higher reduction in pollution exposure compared to the other communities, meaning that environmental justice increase after the program started. As cap and trade and other environmental markets are considered for future climate policy in the United States, we need to be aware of the possible effects that these policies may have in disadvantaged communities. And we hope that our paper helps inform this debate. Thank you, Denai. That was, that was fascinating. So when did you decide you wanted to be an economist? Um, well, I grew up in Orizaba, Veracruz, which is a very small town in Mexico, and um, there are many rural communities and poor communities nearby. And when I started growing up, we went to several volunteering missions, and what I realized that I wanted to eradicate poverty. So, and I also knew that I really like math. So I thought, well, I might as well just study economics. <laughs> Oh, that is so perfect. Uh, you don't think of, of uh, you know, a desire to do social justice work and loving math is always, you know, totally going together. So you found, yeah, I think you found the right profession. So that's great. Yeah. So when, um, so what was it like when you were growing up? What was, it was a small town you said? Yeah, well, it's a, it's around 100,000 inhabitants, but it's a small for Mexico. So it was very nice to Growing, growing up, I was able to um, live in a small community while also being able to go to some other places such as Mexico City and everything. So after I, when I, after I finished high school, I went to study to Mexico City. Um, and yeah, that's how I ended up being there. So did you come from Mexico City here? Yeah, the... yeah. I, yeah, I, I came from Mexico City. I studied there and then came right away to UCSB. Great. So, um, so what is the what is the most exciting part of your research? Obviously, I can see you have a passion for it, for the results making a difference. But what in terms of actually the technical part? What's what's the most exciting? What's the hardest? Uh, I think that the hardest but most exciting part was to learn how to run an atmospheric transport model in order to associate pollution emissions. So that's not something we learn in economics. And I had to learn it for this project, which was great to learn from other interdisciplinary approaches on how to do it. And I think that's the most rewarding part. Great. Um, and what is your favorite place on campus? I would say Campus Point, but I also need to say that both uh, North Hall and Brent Hall are my favorite places to be. It's where all the people that I care about and that I work with are, and I have missed them a lot during the pandemic. So I think those are my favorite places. So you, you haven't been able to come to campus? Do you, do you work in a lab on campus? No. So, no, not yeah. at all. I think, I think we're all missing both, uh, both the beauty of the campus and our special uh, relationships in the building. So thank you very much, Denai, and, um, and good luck with your work. Thank you. Thank you so much. So our next uh, presentation is by Logan Kozel um, from, again, the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Marine Biology. Every year, the world relies more on aquaculture to provide protein to its growing population. However, marine species are under acute threat from heat waves, which are increasing in both frequency and duration. One such species is the green shell mussel, a species of immense cultural and economic significance to the country of New Zealand. Green shell mussels make up over 85% of New Zealand's annual aquaculture export, but recent heat waves have literally cooked thousands of mussels in their shells on New Zealand's northern shores. So my research investigates whether parental experience can mitigate the effect of marine heat waves in aquaculture across generations. If an adult animal, such as a mussel, is exposed to an environmental stressor, particularly while forming their sperm or eggs, this can induce a change in performance in their offspring when those offspring experience the same stressor in the future. 
through the maternal line, these transgenerational effects can be driven by maternal provisions. Things like lipids and proteins, which can pass directly from mom to offspring through her eggs. Through both the maternal and paternal line, epigenetic modifications can transfer from parent to offspring and influence future gene expression. While epigenetic modifications do not change the DNA sequence itself, they can change the way the DNA is packaged, influencing which regions are tightly wound around proteins called histones, shown on the left in blue, and which regions and which genes are easily accessible for enzymes to transcribe and express. So I wanna show you one way that this can play out. I conducted an experiment where I exposed female muscles to either control or marine heat wave temperatures during the summer, and then allowed some of the heat stress muscles to recover prior to reproducing, while some remained at high temperatures. Then I assessed the development of their offspring to see how they coped with the heat stress themselves. As you can see here, the offspring which came from mothers who experienced a marine heat wave, but were allowed to recover prior to reproducing, had significantly higher normal development than those from control or heat stressed mothers. Aquaculture provides a really unique opportunity to manipulate the parental experience and to actually treat the two sexes differently in ways that are not possible in natural populations. In addition to manipulating parental experience, I can also look at thermal variation that exists naturally in regions where muscle farms are found across space and depth to see whether there are regions that are acting as thermal refuges or actually driving positive or negative transgenerational effects. Thank you, Logan. That was, uh, that was really interesting. So um, thanks. Yeah, tell, tell us like how you came to want to do this kind of work. Um, well, I think I've always loved the ocean and I've always been really fascinated by fisheries as kind of a conjunction between marine biology and things that are really applied and have, you know, relevance to so many people's daily lives and so many large scale economies. Um, but I don't think I ever really have a tangible plan one step to the next. I kind of just am always open to what opportunities present themselves. And I've been really lucky to meet awesome people who uh, have allowed me to open the doors to these different types of work. But I never really had a grand plan along the way <laughs> at all. <laughs> we went from loving the ocean to somehow getting into this field where you could spend a lot of time. I, I have to say, when I was in fourth grade, I wanted to be an oceanographer just because I liked the ocean, but um, I didn't have all the rest that it took to get there. So, um, so where did you where did you grow up? I grew up in Guilford, Connecticut. It's uh, a really tiny town, um, a very like tight knit, um, wonderful community, and uh, it's like right on the water, but it's on Long Island Sound, so it's not not the true ocean. So how, so what, what's your story from there to here? Um, I guess I, in college, I worked in a fish evolution lab, which was my first experience doing research. And I loved that. I got to do both really, you know, detailed technical uh, molecular biology, but also do field work and be bumping around in like tiny little streams and random places in Tennessee and Alabama. And I really loved that, but I wanted to do science that could be readily used by people um, and really readily applicable. And so that's kind of where I wanted to transition to uh, working in something more fisheries aquaculture focused. And this is a really good place for that. So what is the, what's the hardest part of your research and what's the most rewarding? I think the hardest part, as is just really common with biology, is that animals are not necessarily going to do what you want them to do. And especially since I'm a larval biologist and I work with animals reproducing, sometimes they're not going to spawn when you want them to spawn, or sometimes they're going to want to spawn 
at three in the morning and they're going to want to reach a critical stage of development at three in the morning the next day. And you kind of just have to roll with it. Um, and also a lot of times things just fail completely, which I think is a good test in resilience and trying to figure out, okay, this didn't work. What can we make out of this that will still be interesting and valuable, which is also the most fun kind of like the yeah. lack of predictability. And I get to work with really amazing people. Both my lab mates are so collaborative and fun and supportive and also with the work that I do specifically, it's awesome because I get to work with both private sector, industry scientists and academic scientists. And I get to work with the muscle farmers themselves and all of these different perspectives and the really interesting connections that that brings. And you have been able to work in your lab since the pandemic. Yeah, I have, a, I have been able to go in a little bit, um, but it's, it's very different because that collaborative atmosphere is not is not there as much right. anymore. Yeah, nine feet away. So, um, so what is your favorite place on campus? I don't know if this counts as on campus, but I really love Coal Oil Point, the UC um, Natural Reserve, because uh, that's where the leopard sharks are, um, <laughs> and also it's just yeah, it's really beautiful underwater there. Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences. Imagine a scenario where you're in the forest foraging for some fruit. You hear a rustling sound as a mountain lion slowly creeps out, eyeing you like he's come across his next meal. This is surely a scenario that'll send just about anyone into a state of stress. But in that moment, there's a calculation occurring between your brain and your body. What type of stress response should we have? We call this calculation the biopsychosocial model of challenge and threat. This model evaluates your perceived individual resources compared to your current situational demands and alerts your cardiovascular system to respond accordingly. Let's say in one scenario that as you eye this lion, you think, you know, I've been practicing my combat skills and my friends are right behind me. I think we can take him. This type of evaluation is likely to send you into a state of challenge where your perceived individual resources, your social support skills and mindset outweigh your current situational demands. Whereas in another scenario, perhaps you see this lion and you think, this is bad. I'm out here on my own and I have no idea how to defend myself. I might as well curl up in a ball and protect my neck. This is a case where your situational demands, some uncertainty or perceived danger, are outweighing your evaluated resources, and it's likely to send you into a state of threat. These two responses are linked to overall mental health and performance. For instance, a challenge response is linked to increased performance outcome and mindfulness, whereas threat responses are linked to diminished performance and rumination. This survival mechanism occurs in us daily in response to events such as work deadlines, social evaluation, and shame. Behaviorally, these quick responses might look quite similar, but by measuring a person's cardiovascular system, we can calculate which response is occurring. My goal in my research is to measure how the cardiovascular system responds to stressors on a second by second basis. And I was curious how performance feedback on a stressful task can affect people's evaluative models. To examine this, I gave participants fake feedback on how they were performing on a stressful math task that varied between positive and negative feedback. This feedback had nothing to do with their actual performance. But what I found was that single individuals altered between states of challenge and threat tracking with our feedback. We found that it was relatively easy to place people into a state of threat with negative feedback, whereas we had to give extremely positive feedback to push people into a state of challenge. Furthermore, we were able to see these results regardless of whether or not people even believed that feedback was real. Thank you, Victoria. Yeah, Great project. So <laughs> tell me, did you, um, did you always want to do some kind of psychological science? Yeah, I, I think I probably did by always I mean, since I was a kid. I've always been 
you know, what's more interesting than learning about ourselves and <laughs> figuring out how do I function as a human being in the world? Um, yeah. And then in, in undergrad, I actually went to UCSB and did biopsych in undergrad. I took a brain states class with Genesonis. And I learned about really the neurological and physiological effects of stress. And I was just mind blown because it's a little more common to know now, but at least back then I was just like, what? No one told me I'm damaging myself by every test I stress about. <laughs> and um, yeah, I looked around and I was like, um, we should really learn just how damaging this can be. And um, you know, get the word out there. So that's what got me into stress, particularly within neuroscience. So do you still think about this when you get stressed? Yes, that is actually the, the hard part about my research is stressing out about being stressed because you know how bad it is for you. <laughs> but I'm sure um, that's right. Yeah. So where, where did you grow up? Um, I was born in Ukraine, but I moved to Van Nuys in Los Angeles when I was young. So I grew up around there. California. Mm -hmm. Yes, California. Yeah, great. So you, you said a little bit about what's hard. Thinking about stress is hard in your research, but um, what else is, is difficult about doing it and what is, what is particularly rewarding? Yeah, um, so... That is, that is part of um, what I'm thinking about what's like a hard part about learning about stress is really the deeper you go in it, it's kind of hard to disassociate from learning about it and then not feeling that anxiety and stress about like envisioning all the things that might be happening to my body when I'm in a moment of stress. <laughs> um, but the rewarding part is also like with that knowledge comes knowing how to you know, deal with that. And something that I find really rewarding is kind of noticing people's interest in this topic. And authentically, they're really curious about just talking with me about like, what exactly is happening to my body? And what can I do to outweigh that or, you know, the kind of towards like mindfulness and stuff like that. So I really find it rewarding that people are just really enthusiastic to listen to my research and discuss this topic more and discuss how we can all kind of better ourselves and better our way of handling stress. Cause you can't stop stress from happening. You can only handle how you respond to it. Yeah. No, that makes sense that people would be really interested in, in just the, the basic concepts. So uh, what is your favorite place on campus? Um, I like to park in that lot above campus point. I know this has been a very common <laughs> answer and there's a reason for that because it's beautiful and yeah I like to park there and then kind of force myself to have that walk every day to to the psych buildings and notice the ocean and take it all in before going into the basement where the brain imaging lab is yeah no I totally get it I always say it when I drive up to campus if I ever don't look out there and say wow I'm so lucky to be here that I'll be really mad at myself well, thank you. Yes. Thank you very much for your really interesting work and a great presentation. Thank you. So our um, next presentation is by Nora Wolcott uh, from the Department of Molecular, Cellular, and Developmental Biology. If you know one of the 5.8 million people suffering from Alzheimer's disease in America alone, and chances are you do, you may recognize the phrase, I couldn't find my way home. Navigational deficits are one of the first reported symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, yet we have very little idea of how these symptoms occur. Now, why is this? We pour billions of dollars into Alzheimer's research each year, and there are several established animal models with which to study the disease. Yet the precise mechanisms by which Alzheimer's robs us of our ability to navigate remain unknown. The answer lies in the learning and memory center of our brain, the hippocampus. Now, when we think of brain research, we typically think of something like this, a brain sliced up, put on a slide to be looked at under a microscope. Sometimes we even take these slices and insert electrodes to try and emulate human brain function. 
there's one major problem with both these techniques. A dead mouse can't navigate. Because of this, many researchers have developed methods to study the brains of live animals. If you've ever watched Grey's Anatomy, you may recognize phrases like MRI and PET, which are whole brain scanning techniques. However, they lack the cellular resolution we need for diseases like Alzheimer's. Alternative methods involve implanting a glass window into the skull of a live mouse so that you can use a microscope to visualize specific neurons. But there's a problem with this as well. The hippocampus lies under the surface of the brain, making it intractable to visualize using any of these methods. My research examines Alzheimer's pathology in the hippocampus of awake behaving mice. So how do we do it? Well, let me introduce you to the hippocampal microperiscope. By implanting this tiny one millimeter glass prism into the brain of a live mouse, we can, for the first time, gain optical access to the entire hippocampus. Under a microscope, we can then put the mouse in a floating environment so that it can actively navigate while we record the activity of its neurons. Think of the floating environment like a big air hockey puck lined with flashy patterns to stimulate brain activity. With our microperiscope, we can then compare a healthy mouse to a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease and see what is specifically disrupted in the context of navigation. With these advancing technologies, we hope that in the future, no Alzheimer's patient will have to say, I couldn't find my way home. Thank you. Laura, thank you. Wow, that is thank fascinating you. research. And uh, sounds very, very complicated. Yeah, it is indeed. So when did you decide you wanted to be, be a biologist or do this kind of research, this kind of work? Yeah, absolutely. So I think when a lot of people talk about sort of their biologist origin story, um, they talk about like keeping a journal of the insects in their backyard or something, um, which is sort of cliche. Uh, but I did do that. <laughs> um, I had a journal of like all the animals in my yard that I used to keep. And, you know, as I grew older, uh, like many of us, my family was affected by Alzheimer's disease. And so that really drove me towards the field of neuroscience and brain research and sort of this science in particular. Well, I think there's a reason for these cliches. So the, the keeping track of the insects in your yard is probably a, a good sign we should watch for. In, <laughs> exactly. Young, in, in young kids growing up. Mm -hmm. So um, where, where did you grow up? So I'm from Buffalo, New York, go Bills, um, which was a really great city to grow up in. It's very friendly. People are very driven to help each other. So I really think it's shaped me into the person I am today. Did you go, where did you go to undergraduate school? Oh yeah, I went to George Washington University in DC. So I have always been an East Coaster, only recently become a West Coaster. And unfortunately it's been pretty pandemic heavy <laughs> since I've been here. So I haven't gotten to do quite as much adventuring as I would have liked, but hopefully in the future that will happen. That will, that will happen. So, so tell me the, the most challenging, difficult, I'm well, obviously getting into the mouse brain sounds like challenging <laughs> enough, but um, the, you know, what is the most challenging or difficult and what is the most, uh, what, what part of the research makes you the happiest? Yeah, absolutely. I think Alzheimer's disease as a field is really messy. Um, there's a lot of conflicting ideas. There's a lot of things that have seemed really promising. And then when people have gone down that route, it you know, hasn't worked out, even though it really seems like it should have, which can be pretty frustrating. Uh, so it's hard to really get to the bottom of what exactly we think is going to work. But I am hopeful that we are getting to the bottom of it. And, you know, in the next couple of decades, hopefully we'll get somewhere. Um, but I think it's absolutely inherently rewarding as a field because it has touched so many people. And every time I tell someone what I do, they say, oh, my grandma has Alzheimer's, my mom, my grandpa. So yeah, I love what I do. No, that's got to be totally, totally rewarding. One of these days, there won't be any. So, and then you'll be feeling like there's, you're part of getting rid of Alzheimer's. Um, yeah. So, absolutely. are you a Campus Point person? Or <laughs> I love Campus Point, <laughs> like everyone else. Um, 
I will say in addition to science, I do some music stuff and I really love the music courtyard on campus. It's a really peaceful spot. Um, and I've been missing it during the pandemic. So hopefully I'll get to go back soon. Great. Well, I hope so. Thank you so much and, um, and best of luck to you. Thank you. And now we come to our uh, last, but certainly not least, presentation by Diksha Dangwal from the Department of Computer Science. Isn't it creepy how your phone somehow knows that you've gotten into your car and knows where you're going and even tells you how long it's going to take to get there? Or have you ever seen ads for products you definitely haven't searched for before, but may have talked about with a friend? Today, it's nearly impossible to escape such technology. While this sort of automation makes our lives easier, it is also a serious privacy risk. Here's what's happening behind the scenes. Your smartphone provides detailed and precise location information. Some apps collect and sell this information to advertisers and even hedge funds. This data is anonymized, but clever attackers can easily undo this anonymization. For example, a time study was able to identify a New York school teacher just from her location data. Her data included her visits to the gym, a trip to the dermatologist, and time spent at her ex-boyfriend's apartment. They were even able to pinpoint her exact classroom. As things stand today, we leave a trail of breadcrumbs or a trace of all our online and offline activities that can leave our private information extremely vulnerable. Apps have legitimate and illegitimate access to sensitive data. As a computer scientist, I build systems to protect our sensitive data by minimizing private information leakage. One solution is to obscure private information from these apps. So instead of recording my exact location coordinates, I could dispense noisy coordinates that only reveal my location approximately correctly. Another solution is to share private information less frequently. Instead of recording my location every two minutes, I might choose to record my location every 20 minutes. But both these methods come at the cost of utility of the app. My mapping app will function quite poorly if it only records my location every 20 minutes. My work introduces a new privacy model called ringing, which explores this trade-off space between privacy and utility. It presents a sliding scale to users that rings out private information and only shares the critical data to find optimal configurations to balance both these needs. Ringing uses methods from optimization theory and extreme lossy compression to find this balance. I envision a future where technology is even more ubiquitous, immersive, and automated, but not one where it is invasive. Thank you. Thank you, Deeksha. That is that is certainly a topic that we all um, that we all confront on a daily basis. So, um, tell me when you decided you wanted to be a computer scientist. Um, I think during undergrad, I was working a lot on um, just like embedded systems and little chips that you can kind of build robots out of, and that was a lot of fun. And that made me decide that I would, you know, become a computer scientist. And that's how it started. I wanted to build robots. And do you get to build robots? <laughs> no, not anymore. <laughs> I could if I wanted to. <laughs> I'm sure you could. Um, so where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in Bangalore in India. Yeah. When did you come here? I moved here in 2014. So um, tell me a little bit more about the, the way you do your research. What, is, what, is, what are the technical challenges in doing this research? Um, and what other than you know, figuring out how to, how to make these changes would be very, very rewarding. Like what else makes you really happy about doing it? Um, I think seeking out interesting problems itself is very rewarding. And then spending a lot of time solving those problems, uh, a lot of effort solving those problems is just even more rewarding. I think the best part about 
computer science research is the problem solving. But what's really hard about it? Also or problem is- solving. <laughs> <laughs> It's really interesting. I think for almost everybody, the hardest and the most rewarding parts are the are, are pretty much the same, the same kinds of things. That's how we do research. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, that's that is that is really the way it is. So, um, what is your favorite place on campus? Um, I would say it is the lagoon, but in particular, I really like walking down to the lagoon from Harold Frank Hall, which is where my lab is, and kind of taking that scenic route down to the lagoon and just enjoying the scenery there. Yeah, that's really nice. And and have you been able to be in your lab since the pandemic? No, no. no. I work on computers. There's no need for me to. So you don't there. need to be there. Yeah, great. Well, thank you very much, um, Diksha, and, um, and good luck. And I hope you keep all of our private information safe in the future. Thank you. Thank you. So that is our last presentation. Um, feel free to continue adding questions to the chat, although we, we have, um, we have a, a lot of them in the chat um, as we also begin our people's choice uh, voting. So on your screen, you should see instructions for how to vote either using the QR code or with the web address. You can also access these instructions in the link on the YouTube description in case you have any trouble using the QR code. We'll continue to broadcast the QR code and URL throughout our group Q&A with the presenters. So I'm going to um, just pose a question for each of our presenters that you have, um, that you have, that you have asked. And um, some of these may, uh, may take an entire course for them to answer. So first of all, Emily Hardison, question um, for you is animals evolve and adapt slowly. So how do fish adapt so quickly? The question, my my internet cut out. There. Oh, sorry. So animals evolve and adapt slowly. So how do fish adapt so quickly? Yeah. So um, thank you for the question. Uh, you're totally right that adaptation takes multiple generations. Uh, so what I study is acclimation, which is really a question of what can an animal tolerate within its own generation. What can it tolerate on its own and cope with? Um, And so for fish being able to acclimate to different temperatures, especially in the context of rapid uh, changes in temperature that are occurring with climate change is really important. Um, Thank you. Great. Um, So for Greta Kumarianu, um, if you had an opportunity to put an experiment on the Perseverance rover before it left for Mars, what experiment would you have placed on it? Mm, I guess I really believe in my experiments as something they can measure these two ratios. Then uh, now that the rover is looking for life in Mars, then it could, we could get some more information about it. So I have to vote for my experiment, I guess. Just not ready yet. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I have one other question for you um, from the audience. How far away does your instrument have to be to detect the signal you described? Yeah, so... Uh, I mean, it's really, and uh, it's nowhere close to be somewhere, but the sample has to be inside the instrument. So imagine taking some dirt and putting it in something like that. So very close. Okay. Thank you. For uh, Laura Kastner, how do you see yourself in the future advocating for foster care and adoption rights for LGBTQ plus future parents? That's such a good question. I think as a historian, I have a unique role where people are listening to historians right now. And historians have done things like write amicus briefs for the US Supreme Court that were have been used by justices. So that's part of the work that I hope to do as well as being involved in on the ground organizing. Great, and a follow up to that one. Um, given the current composition of the Supreme Court, do you think the foster care decision is preordained or predetermined? Let's just say I, I don't think it's looking great for queer foster parents. I'm not super optimistic, but I also know that that's not the end of the story. There are going to be ways to continue local organizing and to continue a long strategy that will, in the end, I believe, lead to change 
as I said, no matter what the Supreme Court says. And that's uh, that is one of the things that we can take hope from in history is that things do change. Um, for Kelsey Dowdy, um, how do you hope this research will influence how invasive species are studied in the future? Um, I hope that we stop using the word invasive and kind of move on to more productive uh, metaphors. You know, that metaphor was created to inspire action, um, like war metaphor, but I think we've had enough war and uh, really there's a lot more productive things we can do if we understand the plants from different angles and see them all as we see them, which is subjective and, um, you know, admit that nothing's good or bad. We can really, I think, learn a, a lot more about the source of how these um, plants are, where they are and what they're doing and, you know, acknowledge that we're part of that. Um, and another question uh, that was posed for you, who have been significant contributors to nitrogen runoff issues? Uh, yeah, so like industrial agriculture, so large uh, farms that are typically monocultures, so one crop um, that use synthetic fertilizer, um, that nitrogen is really susceptible to being run off versus smaller farms that are using organic methods. The fertilizer takes longer to process into a, a form of nitrogen that can run off. So um, the nitrogen sticks around, which is good for the plants and good for, um, you know, all of us drinking that water and, you know, all of us who want to see um, plant communities be diverse. And one quick question. Did you make the flute? Say that again. Did you make the flute? Oh, I didn't make the flute. Actually, this flute is, it's from uh, someone in the music department, Scott Marcus, who's a professor in the music department. And he graciously introduced me to the flute um, when I was in the Middle Eastern Ensemble and taught me a lot about the Sufi metaphor surrounding it and taught me how to play it. Um, so if you're out there, Scott, thank you. Couldn't have done it without you. But I hope to make one, one day. <laughs> Great. Um... And uh, let's see, for Caitlin Zigner, um, what are some simple policies and procedures cities can adopt to reduce wildfires? Yeah, that's an amazing question. We've been in contact with Santa Barbara city officials recently, um, and we've been looking into the possibility of incorporating some orchards and possibly some agricultural areas. Right now, we're just trying to see in models how much this would limit the fire spread toward uh, the city and the uh, communities, the highly populated regions. Um, but we are just communicating with them at this point and kind of seeing what we can model and see how it would impact the community. But we hope these findings will be written into some procedures in the future. Great. And uh, after your research, what are you hoping for society to gain and do you and uh, do to reduce fire seasons in Santa Barbara? Yeah, that's a really great question. Again, I feel like just having a broader audience understand the implications of wildfires. And I feel like after this summer, especially, more people um, are really aware of how wildfires impact communities all around the world. So getting a broader public audience is a really great first step as unfortunate as wildfires are. Um, and then there'll be hopefully more funding and more research on wildfires and see how we can incorporate new policies or maybe some land change um, to increase resilience around the world. Okay, thank you. Um, so for uh, Denai Hernandez-Cortez, uh, economists have an important role in understanding socioeconomic disparities, which you, um, you, you referred to. Has the recent social justice movement inspired you to continue research at the intersection of economics and social justice? Yes, this is a great question. I think that the, as we see the trends of environmental disparities have been increasing worldwide. So uh, people who are minorities and people of color have experienced a higher degree of pollution historically. And I think that that needs to change in order for us to achieve a sustainable and equitable future. So I think that even though an economist can bring some uh, tools that we learn uh, in, in during our PhD to understand those issues, what are the sources and what policies can help alleviate those challenges? And there was a related question, which I, I think um, 
may, may, you may really have already addressed, how can your work help improve the life of marginalized, marginalized populations um, and uh, in, in other countries as well? Yes, so one part of this research is that many uh, developing countries do not have studies that have shown disparities. And so I think that one thing that we can do is to first quantify those disparities and analyze which policies could help close them, especially in places that have very low access to data, such as India, Mexico, or places in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so I hope that my research helps close that gap. Great. Thank you. Um, for Logan Kozal, do you think that your results apply to other kinds of muscles or other creatures? So people in my lab actually work on similar questions on a lot of different species and particular um, urchins, both red and purple urchins. Um, and we've seen similar results in terms of the maternal effects that I was discussing. Um, and there's other people in my lab, uh, Janine Chamorro looks at the California mussel, um, it lives Californianus. And uh, they're really interesting because they uh, are intertidal. And so they span the intertidal gradient, which has, you know, huge, huge range of not only temperature stress, but also desiccation stress and all these other things that they're dealing with. Um, and so she uh, tackles all of those complicated questions, but What's interesting to me is the results can kind of vary from species to species. So we see positive transgenerational effects in some species and we see negative transgenerational effects in other species. It's still kind of a new field, so we don't know how everything will respond. But we also see variation, as I was discussing, between the two sexes. So, for example, I've done experiments just manipulating the paternal line of muscles and the green shell muscles and really only saw negative paternal effects. Um, and so that's interesting in aquaculture where you can pick and choose, you know, what you do to each uh, line of brood stock, but that might have very different implications in a wild population where both the males and the females are experiencing the same thing. Um, so I guess in short, I don't know because not only can it vary across species, but it can actually vary depending on the stressor um, within the same species or along the two different uh, parental lines. Very interesting. Okay, for Victoria Babenko, um, how might your research be prescriptive? How can individuals turn threats into challenges for themselves? That's a great question. Um, so it could seem discouraging at first that it's so easy to push people into a state of threat. But the positive thing is that, you know, we know this comes from a state of perception. So it's not something external that's actually causing this necessarily, but it's like your perception of your ability. So really it comes from an internal point of view of um, where you have to work is more internal. So mindfulness decreasing, rumination, um, all of those mindfulness is seen to be related with challenge responses rumination with threat responses. So um, it actually, you know, stress in general, you know, we can't stop it from happening to us. And when the stressor ends, that's not when our stress response ends. Our stress response ends from a cycle of different things that we have to do to actually stop that stress response. Um, but that could sound discouraging, but it's actually a positive thing. So it's all really internal. So um, yeah, it's, it's hard to exactly point out like which things you have to do, but whatever that means for you. This is, a, this is sort of a more um, applied question. Um, your research is applicable in so many areas. Do you see it informing educational systems and human resource departments? Yes, definitely. I think that it's really related to um, stereotype threat and to generally how um, students can feel under, under pressure, under feedback, under, um, you know, not just in the, in students, but also in employees and everything. So I think it's general, definitely something that's important to discuss in schools and, um, within companies to discuss with their employees as well. And for employers to learn about this and for teachers to learn about this, that just their feedback can really affect a student or an employee, even if that 
feedback is just coming from their perspective and totally irrele- not real uh, <laughs> non relevant <laughs> to how the person is actually doing. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, for Nora Wolcott, what areas of technology do we need to, to advance in order to get a better understanding of Alzheimer's? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's been a lot of really exciting technological advancements in even the recent like couple months. Um, I don't know if you have heard, but they actually recently developed a blood test for Alzheimer's disease, which is a huge step forward as opposed to having to get something like say a spinal tap, but you still only detect it um, pretty far down the line. So we're definitely making the strides towards building up what hopefully is going to be a future without Alzheimer's disease. Um, I'll say additionally, there are sort of like two things that go on in Alzheimer's. One is amyloid beta plaques, which for a long time are what biopharma companies were aiming to tackle. But now we're looking more at this tangly protein called tau. And so that's really a lot of the focus of the research right now. And it seems like people are having great results. So hopefully by targeting sort of that other protein, we're going to make real strides towards solving this problem. Thank you. Um, and now for Diksha Dangwal, how much control can individuals actually have over their own device privacy and how much has to be offered by app developers? Um, currently, there isn't that much uh, control that you have unless it's a, an app that specifically is um, selling you privacy. So like if you wanted to use something like Signal or you know, there's other uh, alternatives to Zoom that specifically promise you privacy Um, unless they're doing that, you usually don't have too much control over it. I'm hoping that, you know, my peers research and my research can kind of take us there where we can have that kind of granular uh, control over our data. Um, There are some strides with differential privacy that are also doing this, but currently they're not all very mainstream. It's still very much a work in progress. Great, and uh, someone wanted to know uh, more about lossy compression. Oh. Um, Can you say more about it? So I'm at a loss. <laughs> okay, so basically sometimes, like if you're compressing images and sometimes they kind of look blocky, the reason it's all looking blocky is because it's lossily compressed. Um, lossy compression is great because you can then send it over the internet really easily um, and it basically is a smaller size than if you had just compressed it losslessly. Um, What we did was connect lossy compression to data minimization and as a result, privacy. And I think that's kind of how lossy compression fits into into privacy here. We're minimizing data leakage by just not sharing that data. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, You're just as good on your feet as you are with your videos, but I'm not surprised at all. So we are now ready to announce the People's Choice Award. And here to present it is George Deegan, our 2019 Grad Slam champion from the Chemical Engineering Department. George won with his talk, Healing Muscles with Muscles. Welcome, George. Hi, the People's Choice Award winner is Danae Hernandez Cortez. Fabulous, congratulations. This is, this is really exciting. It's really hard without like everybody being able to clap but uh, just picture that we all are. So um, next we are going to announce our um, other award winners. And you know there were only a couple of people who knew in advance who had won these, um, these awards. And I decided I didn't wanna know in advance. I wanted to be like opening the envelope. And so, um, so I, have, I have a text and um, I think it's just been um, thrown into my, uh, into my, uh, onto my computer. So here we go. Uh, first, we have our runners up. This year, we actually had a tie for our runner up position. So we're awarding an extra $2,500 to an additional competitor. So in 
alphabetical order, drum roll, here we go, our three runners up are Niksha Danwal from Computer Science, Nora Wolcott from Molecular, Cellular and Developmental Biology, and Caitlin Zigner from Geography. Congratulations, Diksha, Nora, Caitlin. Again, thunderous applause. And finally, our grand prize winner is Logan Kozal, Ecology, Evolution, and Marine Biology. Yay. Wow, we did it. We did a virtual grad slam. Congratulations to all of you, winners, fabulous, all of you, the finalists, just terrific. Thank you all for attending. Thank you for these fabulous presentations. And thanks to all of you who made this possible, our donors, our staff, all of our supporters. So please don't forget to tune in to the UC-wide competition on May 7th, where you can cheer on Logan. Have a wonderful evening, and I hope you'll think about everything you've learned in these 10 three-minute segments. I hope you feel as cheered as I do by the brilliance and passion of our graduate students. Thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs>